This series we're in is called Hedges, and it's taken out of the book of Job. Just one verse in Job we're, we're looking at. And, um, you know, usually when you talk about the book of Job, you think of suffering. You know, you think of Job being in fear because he gave offerings just in case his children did some things. And you think about, uh, I think about chapter 42, uh, not to get too deep into that, but it's probably for me the greatest revelation uh, I received out of God's word in chapter 42 when Job said, I have heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you after everything that he had been through and how he stayed the course and spoke God's word and never gave up. I'd heard about you. Uh, but this verse that we're um, um, really, you know, is, is the catalyst for this series. Uh, that we're going to end next week, uh, really is, is, doesn't talk about the suffering. It doesn't even get into all of those things. But it talks about the hedge, the hedge that God has put around us. And it's out of Job chapter 1, verse 10. The New King James puts it this way. Just that verse 10. The New King James says this. It says, have you not made a hedge around him? Talking about Job. All right, around his household and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and increased in the land. And this is right after Job, Job was minding his own business. Satan went before God. God called him out. You remember? Satan, what are you doing? I'm going to and fro to see who I can mess up, who I can jack up, seeing what I can do. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Job was minding his own business. He wasn't doing anything. He was, he was giving his offerings. He was, and God called him out. And the message version, as you see, <laughs> puts it this way. It says, Satan uh, retorted, Satan retorted. So do you think Job does all that? out of sheer goodness, the sheer goodness of his heart. Why? No. No one ever had it so good. Satan said, you pamper him like a pet. You make sure nothing bad ever happens to him or his family or his possessions. You bless everything he does. He can't lose. Now, before we get into the rest of the story about how God removed this hedge from Job and Satan was able to, to, to attack him, everything but his life and all of the chapters of Job, before you even get into all that, let's just land on the fact, can we for a moment, that God has placed a hedge around you. And let's just stop right there. Now, Job was another story. But for you and I, we don't necessarily have to go through what Job went through. God has placed a hedge around us. A hedge. And look at how Satan puts it. You think Satan doesn't think of you this way? You think Satan doesn't want to attack you more than he already attacks you? But he says, you pamper him. You pamper her. You pamper Dawn. You pamper Marilyn. You pamper Jody. You pamper James. You pamper them like a pet. You got this hedge around them. You bless everything they do. They can't lose. I just wish we believed what Satan believed. I just wish we believed what Satan knows. That God has put a hedge around you. He can't touch you unless God allows it. And you can't lose. Your enemy is saying this about you. So then why? Why is it that we lose? Well, Satan knows that we can't lose. God has put a hedge around us that says we can't lose. I only know of one person left that causes us to lose. And that's the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. Come on, somebody. And what happens is this hedge that God has put around us, we allow the breach sometimes in the hedge. By not following the practicality sometimes that God has given us in his word. If you do this, that will happen. It's pretty simple. 
And listen, again, don't get offended because I'm talking to myself as I always say. I look in the mirror and go, listen, dude, this is pretty simple. <laughs> if you do this, I will bless this. It's very simple. But I think in my mind I must have some other way. Or God has some different meaning that uh, he has. So I, I need to study the Hebrew and the Greek to really figure out what God is really saying. And sometimes God is just saying, don't have sex before marriage. Sometimes God is saying, just follow what I tell you to do and you will be blessed. And that's all. And when you look it up in the Greek and you really uh, figure out what he's really trying to say, he's saying, don't have sex before marriage. That's what he says. And there's so many things like that in his word. If we would just follow financial, come on, relationship, which is what we're going to just talk about for a few moments. Uh, uh, deliverance, all of these things, addictions, all of these things. Now, I know it's not easy because we're going through life. And we're, we're tied in this flesh. But there is a spirit man inside of you, the real you, the real you, the real you, that God breathed the breath of life in you, that God has placed a hedge around. And your enemy looks at that. He can attack your body, but when he tries to get to you, he says, you have pampered Jim. You've pampered Travis. You've pampered Clint. You put a hedge around them. And I can't get to them until we remove the hedge. I want to talk a few moments about the relationship hedge and why I feel relationships are so important to us. We talked uh, a few weeks ago about the prayer hedge and how important prayer is and how when we don't pray and we don't have a prayer life, that we allow a breach in the hedge. We talked about the personal hedge. You, you have to take care of yourself. There's a thing called self-love and it's real. And it's a lot different than selfishness <laughs> because you can't give to others what you don't have. Come on. If you're not filled with the word of God, stop trying to tell people what God says. Come on. Somebody need to hear that. I don't know. Probably somebody online. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not calling any names. But I know I've done it before. I'm trying to tell everybody what the Bible says and what people says. And I need to know what God's saying. We talked about the personal hedge. You have to take care of yourself. Relationships are so important. Listen, there's a lot of things that we can accomplish in this life. You know, we have 401k plans. We climb the ladder of success maybe in uh, the job that we have. We graduate college. By the way, congratulations, Christina, uh, on graduating your master's degree. Amen. What an accomplishment. What an accomplishment. We were at our daughter's uh, graduation yesterday as well, and uh, we're just so proud of her, you know, as we saw her walk across the stage, you know, and get that diploma. And uh, what an accomplishment it is. And there are so many things that we set out to accomplish in life. Get married, maybe, have children. Some do, some don't. There's, there's things that we want to accomplish, go to be on Broadway, uh, you know, whatever it may be that we want to accomplish in life. But when the rubber meets the road and whatever other cliche, you can think of when it all boils down what it all boils down to the foundation of everything in the universe is relationships that's the foundation of everything it means all the things you accomplish mean nothing without our relationships beginning with our relationship with God because if our relationship this way is not set our relationships this way will always be a roller coaster throughout life always so relationships are important, and we have to protect that relationship hedge. And so I just want to give us four things that will help us protect our relationship hedge. Now, relationships are multifaceted connections between people, guess what, of all ages, all right, in all places, some for all of life. Some people come into your life for a season, but there are relationships that you have for all of life. And they enhance your destiny. They enhance you. They make you better. And you, them. They must be guarded wisely and persistently. We must guard our relationship. It is not the will of God for us to lose relationships when the enemy attacks us and by offense. It's not God's will. Some people are in your life for a season, but it's not God's will that a wedge come in from the enemy or from your flesh and you lose relationships in life. That is not God's will. 
It is not his will. Paul said in 1 Corinthians verse 10 of chapter 1 that uh, he, he said, I beseech you <laughs> in the New King James and the King James, I beseech you. Some versions say, I beg you, I plead with you to have the same mind. He's saying to, to, to find a way to think alike. Paul begs us, to, we cannot settle for the division that the enemy has brought to us. We can't settle for it. We must continue to work. No, it's not easy because many of us, especially those of us who have lived for a while on this earth, uh, we have experiences that contribute to our mindset. We have things that we've been through. We have teachings and news and all of the things we've been through in life that contribute to it. So yes, it's not easy for us to see through all the muck and understand what Jesus is trying to say. But we must not give up. We must fight for relationships. We must, we must fight. Why? Because it's why we're here. It's why we are here on this earth. And so to guard these relationships, there's four things I want to throw out at you real quick. First of all, guarding God-given relationships, we want to guard them with the hedge of wisdom. In other words, seeing life from a biblical perspective, from a biblical perspective. We have to have wisdom in our relationships. Come on. Relationships are valuable. They're, they're, they're God-given. Listen, they are worth fighting for. They're even worth getting hurt over. They're worth overcoming offenses. And many are worth even being humiliated for. Jesus was. Jesus was humiliated for you and I. He was humiliated by one of his best friends when he was on earth. Peter, who he had spent time with. Come on, you know the story. He, he had performed miracles Peter walked on water out to Jesus. Peter declared to him, I am your boy. I will never, ever, ever deny you. And when it came down to it, he said, I don't know the man. And the Bible says with cursings. I don't know what that means. I don't know what cursings were back then, but I don't know the blankety blank. I don't know what he said. But it was awfully strong. You think that wouldn't hurt you or I? You don't think that would be an offense? Yet Jesus still marched to the cross for Peter. And when he rose again, he told Mary Magdalene, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Make sure you tell Peter. Make sure you tell him that I love him. I already knew what he was going to do, and I still love him. He already knew every mistake you were ever going to make, and he still loves you. He knows the mistakes you're going to make this week coming up, and he still loves you. You want to be like Jesus? Come on, you want to be like Jesus? Relationships are worth fighting for. Every time you decide that you're not going to forgive, and work for that relationship, you're not using faith knowledge. You're using fallen knowledge. You're not using Bible knowledge. Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end is what? Come on, somebody. Destruction. There's a way that seems right to us. It seems right. It seems right to us. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice. He preserves the way of his saints. God does that for us. He knows best. So relationships are worth fighting for. We have to use wisdom. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that you're a placemat for everyone who comes along. That's not what that means. But it does mean that you get up in the morning prepared to forgive. That's just the way you are. That's just, that's how I roll. That's how I roll. I'm not looking for somebody to do me wrong. But I'm just saying I'm prepared to forgive. Because God forgave me. His mercies are new 
every morning and his mercies endure forever. Every morning when you get up, there's already a mercy waiting for you. Come on, somebody say, I want to be like Jesus. There's a mercy waiting for you. Now, is God telling you it's okay to do wrong? <laughs> God forbid. You need to read Romans chapter 7 if you think that. Oh, God is a chastiser. Don't get me wrong. He's a father. He's a father. He's a father and a mother. He's a chastiser. Come on. But the mercy is there. And that's the heart we should have. And then number two, guarding your God-given relationships with the hedge of spiritual discernment, right on the heels of wisdom. We have to have a discernment, the ability to see what is obscure, to feel or perceive what is hidden, to see what's difficult. We have to, we have, to have discernment. We fall into a lot of things concerning relationships because we don't have discernment. What we perceive as love covers our eyes and we can't see. <laughs> or what, just what we want, what we, what we want it to be, covers what's really there. It doesn't mean we're going to act mean to someone. It just means we're able to discern ahead of time. We have to have that discernment. Hebrews 5.14 says it's solid food. Come on, belongs to those who are full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The NIV puts it this way. It says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We have to train ourselves. We don't want to do that. We just want God, God just, I'm just going to pray and get caught up in the third heaven and I want you to show me. But God says, train yourself. You don't want to know how, I, there's, there's not a good prayer and a bad prayer. I won't say that. And when I, by prayer, I don't mean the prayer that you say. I mean the person who prays. I won't say that. But you want to know how you become good at praying? Pray. Pray. Practice praying. God's all right with it. <laughs> He's all right with it. Well, I don't want to go to God until I know how to pray. How are you going to get to know how to pray? <laughs> Practice it. You know how you get to, to be a good discerner? Practice it. How do you practice it? You look, you, you pray, <laughs> and you ask God to open your eyes. Let's not just sing the song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. But let's, let's go out with open eyes. Show me, Lord, what you want me to see, not what I want to see. Be able to detect, define, and decide. Come on. Now, a wrong fix to this would be, uh, you know, if we have some sort of limited response. And I think today it's appropriate. Every generation has their crutch, <laughs> their, their thing that's both a crutch and, uh, you know, something that, that causes them to progress. And every generation has that. And I know in our generation, and I'll say our generation, all of us who are here, the generations who are here, I think that sometimes there are things with relationships that could be fixed if we come face to face and say, you know, that's not the way I meant that. What I was trying to say was this. Oh, I didn't realize that. And I can see your face. Because sometimes I text you. I don't know what that means. Sometimes you text me. That makes it worse. And that's not what you meant. Sometimes you message me, and I, I'm not really sure what you're trying to say. And in my fallen state, I'll make a mistake. It'll be my fault that I'll say, yeah, I'm sure that's what this person meant, what they're really trying to say in my fallen state. But sometimes we just got to come face to face, see each other, look at each other in the eye, and say, this is what I meant, and I love you very much, so we can get past all of this stuff. But when you read posts on Facebook, you just add your two cents to it. Somebody else adds their two cents to it. And next thing you know, we got this big, long post. Everybody's fighting. And it's the Wild West on Facebook. It's the Facebook Wild West. FWW. Sometimes we just need to come together. What you trying to say? Number three, guarding your God-given relationships with the hedge of protection against unresolved offenses. All these go right together. All these go right together. Unresolved offenses. Unresolved offenses hurt us 
so badly. Unresolved offenses cause decades of hurt, decades of separation. Unresolved offenses <laughs> cause wars sometimes. Unresolved offenses. Protecting against unresolved offense and the unresolved offense destroyer. That's what he is. He seeks to break down your hedge and ruin relationships. Listen, I came across this, this, this scripture and I know I've read it before, but it means so much more to me now. Especially being on, the, on, on both sides of this. In Proverbs 18, 19. I don't have it up there. You might want to jot this one down. This is important. Proverbs 18, 19 says this. It says, a brother offended. Watch this now. It's a scripture. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. You know what that tells me? That even people in church, if we offend each other, Sister Carla, sometimes it's harder to mend that fence than it is to go get someone saved who doesn't believe in Jesus. Because those bars of contention are up. I've heard this one before. I've seen this before. She'll never change. He'll never change. Whatever it may be. Unresolved offenses. Really it comes from pride. Hebrews 12, 15 says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Many become defiled by a root of bitterness that gets in us. We see it today. We see it. Not just in our nation. And it's nothing new. But we see it today. Nothing wrong with disagreement, folks. Heck, the apostles disagreed. They disagreed about circumcision. Paul and Peter had a, a, a serious disagreement. Barnabas corrected Paul. Come on. There's a lot of disagreement in the Bible. Nothing wrong with disagreement, but unresolved offenses. That's not godly. It's not godly. We must work to get past these unresolved offenses. Listen, the definition of offense in the, the Greek word uh, says it's this. It's like a bait stick. <laughs> it is. An offense is like a bait stick. Now, I know a lot of people have been, you know, to, to different places, the Philippines and Fiji and Florida. And I've seen people who fish and they use nets. You know, but my, my grandfather, my uncle used to take me fishing and we had uh, worms and crawdads and I, I'd have to reach in there and grab a worm. Ooh, that was nasty. And I had to put it on the hook, that poor little worm. I know. But that was the bait. And I'd throw it in the river. Fish would see it and jump right on it. We're just like those fish sometimes. The devil grabs a worm, puts it on the hook the hook of a fence and throws it right in the river, right where we are. And we jump right on it. We jump right on it. It's a trap. That's what an offense is. We got to get past it. People who pass on false truths only divide. They harm. They say things with a loose mouth. <laughs> we need to guard against this type of thing. Guard against it. I believe there is a scripture that says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Uh -huh. And then finally, number four, guarding your God-given relationships with the head of positive faith. And this is, this is the most important one. Positive faith against negative people. Positive faith against negative people. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. You know, one of the things that I've learned to practice is when someone comes up to me and tells me about someone else, and it, it, it's happened a whole lot more since I've been pastoring for these eight, nine years, but really throughout my life, you can, you can uh, absolutely understand this in your life. 
You have a friend or someone, a coworker, and someone comes up and wants to tell you all the things that they're doing wrong and how they talked about you or whatever they said, and they just want you to jump in their boat. And you know one of the things that I've learned? I've learned that if anyone comes up to me and says, you know, you know, Pastor Dietrich, she was just, she was mean to me and she said this and uh, I don't believe she's this way and, and that's what, you know, you, so you just ought to, uh, you know, you need to have a talk with her. I would say, well, thank you very much for letting me know. But I'm not prejudging anything until I talk to Dietra. Someone says, you know, Kevin, he's just a, he's a bad guy. I saw him, uh, you know, smoking a bunch of stuff and, you know, beating up kids over at Kroger and, you know, running, running people over with carts. He was taking the carts from the kids and running them over and, you know, all of those kind of things. I say, well, thank you for letting me know, you know, Kevin was doing all that. But I'm not prejudging anything until I talk to Kevin. And here's the thing with relationships, guys. Here's the thing with relationships. Would we allow someone else to set our path on our views to, toward relationships? In other words, I would hope that you would be this way with me as well. If someone did something wrong or offended me and someone told me about it, you know, Mike, he was, he was talking about you. That's supposed to be your boy. He was, he was talking about you behind your back. We were over at Sam's Club and he was talking about you. And I say, thank you very much. And then if I go to Mike, even if it was where he said, you know what, man, I did say some things I shouldn't have said. I didn't mean it that way. I already have a forgiving heart. I'm not going to allow the enemy to come in and, and put a wedge in between us. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's what the enemy wants to do. That's what the enemy wants to do. That's why he brings those things up through people. See, we have to already set our mind to have a loving heart, a forgiving heart, a merciful heart, a thankful heart, a grateful heart when we get up in the morning. We can't wait till something happens to decide, oh, you know what, I, do I need to be merciful in this situation? No, you have to already decide that. You have to already decide it. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a perverse man sows strife. A whisperer separates the best of friends, the best of friends. How do we get to where we are today with relationships? How do we get to where we are? A whisperer, something small. It only takes a spark. And that goes both ways. That's positively and negatively. It only takes a spark to set a forest on fire. And your enemy knows that. How can we fall into these traps with our relationships? How can we fall into these traps? Well, we just have to work harder. We have to work harder, folks. These hedge destroyers must be kept out. Don't receive them or their spirit into your hedge. They'll try to justify themselves because they have been hurt and their right to be independent, their right to be, uh, you know, to, to discredit. They, they, they feel like they have all of those things, these hedge destroyers. And when I say hedge destroyers, I mean all of the words of the enemies that come, that come into our ears, okay? We need to resist them with a positive faith. I'll, I'll leave you with this. We have to make up our mind. We have to decide already. We can't say, we can't, we can't go through the rest of our lives as Christians the way that we came into 2020. Here's what I mean by that. We can't be unaware and thinking one thing, assuming that God's doing this and going that direction and be totally caught off guard by what the enemy is doing. We cannot do that anymore. We have to make up our minds now that we are going to be together no matter what, no matter what. No matter our disagreements, as long as we agree, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. His blood covers all sins. He rose again on the third day. All right? If we can agree on that, then God can correct all the stuff that's between us. He's able to correct that. He's able to correct my wrong assumptions and your wrong thoughts. He's able to correct all that. And we can agree on that. But we have to decide that we're going to be together no matter what. That's what we have to decide today. We have to decide that first. If we can decide that, we can get through everything else. 
See, we think the other things are such big issues. And I'm not saying they're not. They're huge issues. But guess what? They're 10 times as big if we're not together. If we don't value relationships, especially the relationship of Christ, that his blood is the tie, the Christian tie that binds us together. Whether you like it or not, I am your brother in Christ. You might not like it, <laughs> but I am your brother. And you are my brother and my sister in Christ. And that's what we have to settle. That's what we have to settle today, here today.